اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ربی شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری وحل لقطتن من لسانی یفقہو قولی Today we are going to start with verse 255 the ayat al kursi and this is the most important and the greatest verse of the holy quran and it is also one of the sublime verses because it is all about allah subhanahu wa taala first of all we will do some ahadith about this verse the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked hazrat ubay ibn kaab razi allah taala anhu which is the greatest verse of the quran and ubay ibn kaab razi allah taala anhu said that the ayat al kursi approvingly the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said abu man mundir may allah bless you in your knowledge now abu mundir was the title what we call kuniyat of Ubay ibn Kaab razi Allah ta'ala anhu and this is a narration from Muslim and the Musnad of Ahmad. This verse is also a verse of protection and this hadith is the proof that Hazrat Abu Huraira razi Allah ta'ala anhu says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made me in charge for the sadaqa tul fitr. What is that? That is the money of or grain given as fitrana on eid a person came and started stealing the grain he says i caught him and said that i will take you to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the thief said i am needy and i am poor so i left him in the morning the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked me what did your prisoner say i replied that he complained about his poverty so i released him the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said take care he is a liar and he will come again the next night the thief again came for stealing i caught him and said now i'm not going to leave you and i'm going to take you to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the thief again complained of his poverty and said leave me this time and i will never ever come again The next morning the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again asked me Abu Huraira what did your prisoner do I replied O messenger of Allah he is so poor that I feel sorry for him and let him go The prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied he is a liar and will come again The next night I sat there waiting for him and when he came I caught him red handed and said that now i will definitely take you to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam every day you tell me the same story and the next day you come again the thief said that leave me this time and i will teach you certain word or kalimas which are going to benefit you i asked what are these he replied that when you go for sleep and read the ayat al kursi Allah will appoint an angel to protect you and till morning shaitan will not come near you so i left him in the morning the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again inquired about the thief i told him the whole story about the thief the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said he spoke the truth although he is a liar and then he said abu huraira Do you know who this man was who has been coming to steal for the last 3 nights I replied no the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that he was shaitan and this hadith is a narration of bukhari so from this hadith we find that shaitan can come to us in the form of a human being especially if unknown and number 2 that the ayat al kursi is a verse of protection and it is a must to read it before going to sleep at night and thirdly that shaitan had knowledge he had ilm but we come to know that knowledge and ilm alone is not enough until and unless you act upon it 
नॉलेज कैन नॉट सेव अस फ्रॉम द फायर्स ऑफ हेल एंड वी शुड ऑल्सो थिंक ओवर दिस पॉइंट वाइल वी आर रिक्वायरिंग नॉलेज ऑफ दीन अपार्ट फ्रॉम रीडिंग द आयतुल कुर्सी एट नाइट इट शुड बी रेड आफ्टर ईच फर्ज सलाह द प्रॉफिट सल्लाम सैड He who reads the Ayat al-Kursi after every first salah, Allah will grant him a grateful heart, a tongue that remembers Allah, the reward of prophets and the deeds of the truthful. Now only the prophets, uh, only the prophets and the truthful can be constant in it, or that person whose heart I have tested for iman. or the one who will be granted shahada so this is where the hadith so the hadith ends here and what do we do that as soon as we say salam after the salah we start talking to someone sometimes our siblings or children or the people who work for us they are waiting for us to finish or we remember some odd job during salah and as soon as we finish we start giving instructions or we start doing something no we have to do sabr and control ourselves and read the ayatul kursi first and then talk to someone otherwise we cannot be persistent in it we will remember to read it sometimes and forget it at another time now the merits that are stated in the hadith are for those who are constant who are persistent in it <clears throat> another hadith says that if a person reads ayat al kursi and dies on that day then nothing can stop him from entering jannah what a tremendous reward and this verse contains the ism e azam do you know what is the ism e azam that attribute or name of allah that when you beseech allah via that name allah does not let you go empty handed and shaitan runs from a house where it is read now this verse is an introduction of allah subhanahu wa taala and you know one feels so inadequate so small so much at loss of words in explaining this awesome verse and the awesome being about which it is rather than understanding it you have to feel it from the core of your heart so please try to sense it with the depths of your heart if you want to comprehend it now the verse has 10 sentence sentences the first sentence is allahu la ilaha illahu now there is no god but he the word allah is like a proper noun for allah's being it means the being who combines all perfections and is free from all sorts of shortcomings there is no god but he explains this being it says that there is absolutely nothing worth worshiping except this being the roots of shirk have been cut by this single sentence al hayyul qayyum the second sentence al hayy al qayyum the alive the all sustaining now hayy means living in arabic out of all the divine names the introduction of this word is to emphasize that only and only he is ever living and beyond death and everything else is bound to end up one day he is living and keeps living what he wants he is qayyum that means one who himself stands firmly and keeps others sustained and supported and this attribute of of allah is particular to him alone 
rest everything needs support of some sort but it is only allah who needs no one's support and on the other hand he supports everything in the universe for example look at the sky supported without pillars the earth the heavenly bodies it is not correct to call a human being qayyum it is not permissible people who corrupt the name they say that we have this name abdul qayyum and the slave that means the slave of qayyum by casually using it just the second part qayyum they commit a grave error resulting in sinfulness and the combination of hay and qayyum from amongst the attributive names of allah is the al ismul azam the great name according to several revered elders Ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhu says there was a time during the battle of badr when i wished i could see what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was doing on arrival i saw him in a state of sajda constantly saying ya hayyu ya qayyum ya hayyu ya qayyum then the third sentence la takhuzuhu sinatan wa la nawm neither doze overtakes him nor sleep now the word sinatun means drowsiness which is the preliminary effect of the coming sleep when a person is about to sleep he feels drowsy first and then goes to sleep so sinatun is that drowsiness while the word norm refers to the full fledged or the deep sleep now the sense of the sentence is that allah subhanahu wa taala is above and beyond the states of drowsiness or sleep when the word qayyum appeared in the previous sentence it told man that allah is holding in perfect working union the whole universe the whole universe is working in a harmony which includes in itself all skies all earth all that is in them one could stray on to the idea naturally so in view of man's instinctive inquisitiveness that the sacred being doing such a huge task must at some time feel you know tired and need some moments of rest and sleep in this sentence man who has limited knowledge limited insight limited power is warned that he should not measure allah subhanahu wa taala on his analogy or that of other created beings never taking him as a similar to one's own self he is above and beyond similarities and analogies his power is absolutely perfect before which these doings are neither difficult nor tiresome and that his sacred being is above and beyond all these sense effects like weariness exhaustion drowsiness and sleep you see sleep denotes a helplessness a weakness for example when sleep overpowers you you cannot do anything so a mabood cannot be helpless no created being is devoid of this need and we see that the greatest love that exists between two human beings is that of a mother and her baby but when a mother is you know crazy going mad with sleep she will say that take this child away from me so that i can sleep for some time it is only allah subhanahu wa taala who is free from this weakness as there is you know any one any buzurg any mabood who can <clears throat> claim a similar attribute that he never sleeps no never no other being that uh, apart from allah can claim that he never needs rest or he never sleeps then the fourth sentence la huma fis samawati wa ma fil ard to him belongs what is in the heavens and what is in the earth everything on the earth or in the heavens is all owned by allah subhanahu wa taala even the most brilliant person on earth cannot imagine what is in the universe 
he cannot even find out he cannot even know what is in the universe imagine owning this all is there any other being who can claim to own everything in the universe just feel the majesty people develop and awe for a person who owns billions or vast areas of land what about the being who owns the universe then the fifth sentence manzal lazi yashfa indahu illa bi iznihi who can intercede with him without his permission to begin with when allah subhana taala is the master and owner of the entire universe and there is no one above him certainly then no one is entitled to question him about anything the option of saying why and wherefore does not exist for anyone however if someone interceding on someone's behalf was possible this too has now been made, made clear that no mortal could ever dare to breathe in the most exalted presence of allah subhanahu wa taala but there are certain servants of allah subhanahu wa taala who have received the favor of his approval and acceptance and who would be specially allowed to speak and intercede in short intercession from anyone for anyone will not be possible without divine permission and i would like to narrate a hadith which will make clear the concept of shifaat Hazrat Anas رضي الله تعالى عنه reports that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that on the day of Kiyama the honest people will collect in one place and say that it would be better if we take someone's shifaat with us to our Rabb. They will go to Adam عليه السلام and say that you are the father of all people. Allah made you. with his own hands and made the angels do sajda in front of you he taught you the name of everything so you go and intercede for us and ask him to take us out of this trouble and take us to a peaceful place what will be this trouble that in the plains of resurrection it will be extremely hot and it would be a, a very long day and everyone would wish that we get out of here as quickly as possible adam alayhi salam will say i don't deserve this honor and he will feel shy going in front of allah subhanahu wa taala he will remember his fault of eating the forbidden fruit in paradise he will say that you go to nu alayhi salam he is the first rasul that is the prophet with the divine book sent for the people of the earth the group will then go to nu alayhi salam and ask him for intercession he will say that i am not worthy of this honor and feel shy to go before allah subhanahu wa taala he will remember his fault when he asked his rabb a question without knowledge and was later very sorry for it then nu alayhi salam will say that you go to the friend of allah ibrahim alayhi salam then they will go to ibrahim alayhi salam <coughs> and ask him for intercession he will say that i don't deserve this you go to musa alayhi salam allah spoke to musa the people will go to musa alayhi salam and ask him but he too will feel shy to face allah because of the murder he committed accidentally he will say you go to isa alayhi salam who is the servant and messenger of allah and his kalima and ruh they will go to isa alayhi salam <clears throat> and then he will say that i don't deserve this go to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is a servant of allah who is close to him and allah has forgiven all his faults then people will come to me that is muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then i will walk and ask permission from my rab to present myself before him then i will get permission when i will see my rab i will fall down in sajda and as long as my rab wants i will remain in sajda then he will say raise your head and ask you will be given say what you have to it will be heard do intercession it shall be accepted then i will 
Lift my head from sajda and praise my Rabb in words. He will teach me at that time. Then I will intercede for which there will be a limit. Then I will take people to Jannah. Then I will return to my Rabb and fall in sajda again. Then I will intercede. Then a limit will be set. And then leave those people in Jannah. I will return for the third time and do the same. And the fourth time I will come to my Rabb and say that, Oh my Rabb, now only the people who deserve hell are left, which according to the teachings of the Quran are destined to hell and have to remain there forever. Now this shows that the Prophet ﷺ will not do intercession for those people who have done deeds which lead to hell. So intercession will only be for those whom Allah has given permission. And even in dunya we see that sifarish or intercession is done for a person who is a little less than merit. But it cannot be done who is totally unfit. For example, a person who has not even passed his metric asks some acquaintance of his who is at a high post to appoint him as a doctor in a hospital. The official just cannot do it. But if there is a person who has done the MBBS but not in good grades or a, in little lesser grades, he can be helped with a little effort. So in the Akhirah, Shifat will be done for those people who have abundant good deeds, but there's a sin also which is blocking their way to Jannah. For example, a person, he went for Jihad and he was martyred there, but his parents were angry at him, so he cannot un enter Jannah because of that. He had the greatest of good deeds to his credit, that is Shahadat, but a sin was cancelling it. Now, after reading this particular sentence, Manzallazi yashfa wundahu illa bi iznihi, certain concepts come to your mind. One is that when puny creatures like us say that, Nauzubillah, I will ask Allah why this was done to me, or while justifying sins people say i will explain this to allah why i had to do that just look at these exalted prophets pure innocent loved and approved by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their lifetimes have a guarantee of paradise <clears throat> or you can say that they are the favorites of allah they are the friends of allah they are the cream of humanity they even cannot dare to stand or lift their head up or their gaze in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then at what place do people like us stand? The second point is the misconception that prevails in our society. That is, live the way you want to. Make no efforts, make no sacrifices for Jannah. Just sit back and relax and rely upon the belief that because we are Muslims, the Ummah of Prophet ﷺ, so he ﷺ will come and miraculously sweep us away to Jannah. No, that's not the case. It's not as simple and as easy as that. One has to come up to a certain merit, a certain criteria, and only then you can have the hope of intercession. And then another point that we learn from the statement of Prophet ﷺ, that a person can do good deeds only if he is given the ability by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what we call tawfiq. Now look at the words of Prophet ﷺ that I will praise my Rabb in words he will teach me at that moment. I will fall down in sajda up till the time my Lord allows me. So we cannot make tall claims about anything we will do because all power and all ability lies in the hands of Allah. 
Then the sixth sentence. It says, "Yalamu ma bayna aidihim wa ma khalfahum." He knows what is before them and what is behind them. Now this means that Allah is the only being who knows the future and past of everyone equally. No other being has this quality other than Allah that he knows the past, present and future of every person on the earth. That is why he is Maliki Yawmiddin because only he can judge why a person did a particular deed because he knows the background, the circumstances, the intentions and any person, no matter how just he is, cannot have this quality or power because he has no knowledge of the past. No knowledge of the hidden, no knowledge of the future. That is why the last and the final decision of every matter lies with Allah alone. Then the seventh sentence: "Wala yohi tu na bishay in minil mihi illa bimasha." And they encompass nothing of His knowledge except what He wills. Now this means that man and the rest of the created beings cannot cover even a part of Allah's infinitive knowledge except a certain part which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself allows to be given out from his knowledge. It says in a hadith that when Musa salam went with Khizr salam in a boat and a bird came and drank water, the amount of water that came out just once in his beak, the mouthful of water that was in the beak of the bird, then Musa salam was told by Khizr salam that the comparison between the water of the whole river and the water in the bird's beak is like the difference between knowledge of ilm knowledge or ilm of Allah and the knowledge or ilm of the whole human race. Meaning that human knowledge is like the water in the bird's beak and the rest of the knowledge is only with Allah which no one knows about. Now human beings do not completely even know about their own bodies. Research on a single cell even has not been completed as yet. It says that whatever the medical science has discovered up till now, up till date, only 30 or 35% of the human body has been discovered. This is about our own body, let alone the billions and trillions of bodies in the universe. Then theories of light, matter, universe are not answered completely. Theories keep changing because man is given only that much knowledge which he is allowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we come to the eighth sentence. Vasaya kursi samawati wal ard. His kursi extends to the heaven and the earth. Now, kursi is translated as chair or the base of power that his power extends over the entire universe. Now, if we read Ayat al-Kursi by comprehending it and feeling it, the greatness of every being and everything will just slide out from our hearts. The greatness of Allah's power will make us tremble with fear. So, what is the result that do not fear anyone other than him? Ibn Kasir has reported from Hazrat Abu Zar Ghaffari anhu, that he asked Prophet wasallam as to what the kursi was and what did it look like. He said, by Allah, who is the master of my life? The seven heavens and the earth as compared with the kursi are like the small circle of the finger ring lying on a plane. 
then the ninth sentence wala yauduhu hifsuhuma and it does not vary him to look after them this means that supporting the two magnificent creations of the heaven and the earth is not the least burdensome for allah since doing so with the perfect power of the absolute master is easy then the 10th sentence wa huwa wa huwa al azim and he is the high the supreme it means that he is the most exalted and great in majesty now in the previous nine sentences the perfections of allah's being and his attributes were stated and after having seen and understood these every rational human being is bound to acknowledge that all honor power and superiority belongs belongs to none but allah subhanahu wa taala so these 10 sentences were a description of allah's oneness and his perfections with clarity and detail now you can all write these 10 sentences and ponder over every sentence and you will know why this verse is the greatest verse of the quran and when the greatness of your rub enters your heart then your prime concern should be that he is pleased and he is obeyed above all and if he is by your side nothing can harm you and this is the gist of the ayatul kursi verse 256 there is no compulsion in religion true guidance has been made clearly distinct from error therefore who renounces taghut and believes in allah has grasped the firm handhold that will never break allah whose handhold you have grasped hear all hears all and knows all now the fir- the first sentence of this verse says there is no compulsion in faith it means that you cannot force on anyone to come toward islam the historical background of this verse is that before islam came jews lived in medina who had knowledge of deen and they were respectable people so the locals of medina would make a vow a mannat that we will make our children jews like sometimes in our society people make a vow that we will make our children hafiz e quran and there are some who say that if allah gives me children i will leave them on uh, so and so mazar or some other mazar now the people of medina who had made such vows are and made their children jews were now worried because now islam had come and they had knowledge of islam and they wanted their children to be muslims especially when the jews were going from medina and their children were also going with them so they thought that we should make our children muslims by force and keep them with us so this verse was revealed that you will not force anyone to become a muslim now this verse should be quoted to people who say that islam came by the sword the widespread misconception the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was instructed again and again by allah subhanahu wa taala that your work and your concern is to convey whether someone believes or not not this is not or this should not be your concern now keeping in view some people raise objections and they say that this verse tells us that there is no compulsion in faith although the teachings of jihad and qital are in islam so they appear contrary to this principle now looking at this uh, a little carefully we can find out that the objection is not valid since the teachings of jihad and qital in islam is not to force people into accepting faith had it been so why would there be islamic injunctions of jizya to provide an umbrella of security for the non believers which protects their life 
property and honor in fact jihad is to remove disorder or what we call fasad for allah subhanahu wa taala dislikes fasad which the non believers are after and it is for this reason that allah has ordained that the fasad created by these people should be removed by jihad and qital so jihad or uh, the compulsion ikraha these two things are totally two separate ideologies another objection is that why is a murtad killed if there is no compulsion in religion i hope you all know what a murtad is a murtad is who after being a muslim decides to be an atheist or uh, adopts another religion and the answer is that this person is becoming a cause of fasad with his kufr he has become a challenge for other people's iman he is a danger for iman he is killed so that people would take heed and not commit this shameful act and we see that the losing of one's iman is the biggest possible loss that can happen to a person any loss is less as compared to this loss but the going of someone's iman means that all ways of his forgiveness are closed and he is destined to hell forever and such a person who is likely to cause this loss to other people of the society should he be left like that should he not be stopped so that he can rob other people of their iman we see that such a person is more dangerous than a robber or a murderer because a robbed person or a murdered person may lead a happy life in the hereafter but the person who is robbed of iman has nothing left anywhere it is just like killing a poisonous snake so that it cannot bite and kill people would you say that the killing of this snake is wrong another misconception about this verse is that for example if a mother tells her child to pray two times and the third time she says so you tell her la ikraha fitin there is no compulsion in religion your job is just to tell and you are not supposed to force the child no this verse is exclusively for non muslims that you cannot convert them by force into islam then the verse says that the correct way has become distinct from the erroneous that guidance and misguidance are clearly evident ghay is that misguidance which is due to wrong concepts that any person who possesses intellect can easily distinguish between the two it is not difficult to distinguish darkness and light filth and purity so there is no use forcing anyone into deen a person whose heart is seeking the truth and is free from the filth of arrogance and prejudice takes no time to accept it then the verse says now whoever rejects the rebel and believes in allah now the word taghut is from tughyan anything which causes man to rebel to disobey allah is taghut the verse says that whoever rejects taghut that is that he will disobey any such force which will hinder his way from the path of hidayah and secondly bring iman on allah then the verse says that has grasped the strongest ring that never breaks now you must be wondering that if the path of guidance and misguidance are so clear and evident like darkness and light 
like purity and impurity, then why do people do not come towards light? Why do people run away from deen? Why do people reject this light and the ways of their deen? The answer is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse. The reason is taghut. And taghut is hindering his way towards the path of truth. And until and unless a person negates taghut and breaks taghut and does kufr with taghut, he cannot reach the path of guidance. And we have to see what this taghut is. The literal meaning is everything that stops you from obeying Allah. So we, we will have to think that what are those things which are a hindrance to, towards the path that lead to Allah. For example, take our own self. We find that after reading two uh, Siparas, our way of thinking and approach towards life changes. Our priorities change and we feel that this is life and life without the Quran was a delusion. But if we sit and think that all these years, what stopped us from studying the Quran? We are doing it, alhamdulillah, now. But all those years which were without the Quran, what stopped us? For example... Your eyes can see and the object is lying in front of you, but you cannot see it because there is darkness, right? Your faculty of seeing, your eyesight and your eyes are there, the object is there. But if there is darkness, you won't be able to see the object. This Quran was there and we had eyes. Why didn't we see it? And the darkness in this case was what? Jahiliya, ignorance, and we were deprived of the joy and pleasure every verse is giving us. Each verse moves you from inside. So it was our own Jahiliya, our own ignorance, heedlessness that made us delay. So the first Taghut is what? Ignorance and apart from that, the second taghut is our own nafs. Our nafs won't let us come this way. It says in a hadith that the worst false god worshipped is your own nafs. For example, one thinks that if I tell someone about deen, people will start calling me a malvi, or if I wear a hijab, I won't look nice. What would my friends call me? And sometimes the taghut is in other people or they are present in the society, which is the third kind of taghut. You have knowledge, you have conquered your nafs, but, but people won't let you live. For example, there may be such people in your life and that you want to do it, but they won't let you do it. For example, right when you want to study the Quran, your child comes and asks for your attention. And it seems that following deen becomes a hurdle race, crossing one hurdle after the other. And this is where the test lies. Someone comes and says that this is my right, so give me time. Someone comes and says, I love you, so come and give me time. Someone is coming from for one reason, the other is coming for another reason. And you will have to deal with all these situations. So, Taghut has three kinds and everything comes under one of these categories. Right? Number one, lack, lack of knowledge. I'm summing it up for you. Number one, lack of knowledge. The Quran was there, but we never bothered to understand Number two are nafs. All the diseases of the nafs come under this. This is everything that you have to fight from within yourself in order to obey Allah. No other being has uh, to do anything with it. It is but your own self, your own desires, your own insecurities, your own uh, weaknesses. You have to deal and conquer from within yourself and people who have misconcepts about deen come under this category.
then the third taghut which is from the outside and this taghut is the worst of all you are getting knowledge you have somehow managed to conquer your nafs but this third taghut will not leave you he will make fun of you he will laugh at you he will criticize you he will humiliate you he will try to break you down call you a mad person call you a fundamentalist and extremist so much so that you will feel that i was better off when wa- when i was on my previous ways at least everyone was happy with me and there was not so much tension in my life and i can't take all this should i fight with myself or the people around me better go back on my old ways and come out of this tension then what should you do faman yakfur bitaghut do kufr with taghut that i will not obey taghut i will jump over all the obstacles i have seen the light i have found the gu- guidance and i have to follow it at any cost and what else you should what else you should do wa yu'min billah believe in allah keep your trust in allah and depend on allah's power such a person will put his life on the right track like you know have you ever played that obstacle race in which there is one obstacle after the other imagine if the runner sits before every obstacle and says how can i jump this and win or i will fall down while jumping over this obstacle no he will never be able to win but the one who jumps over all the obstacle with will and power and trust that i will reach the destination one day so this is the person who will get hidayat and this is the person who will be able to break and jump over all these taghuts and this is the person about whom the verse says that he has grasped a strong ring he has found a reliance but the condition is that first he has to overcome all the taghuts one who cannot cope with the taghuts cannot found cannot find his way and what is this urwat al wuska which is a reward for the pain you have to go through in overcoming all the taghuts urwat al wuska the strong grasp which you get this strong imagine this strong ring which you will hold after overcoming all these obstacles what will you get what are you running for that you will get hold this hold of this ring which will give you st- stability and what is that let's explain what urwat al wuska means number 1 the tawfiq to do good deeds allah says that i have shown to you both ways and the one who has managed to come after breaking all the taghuts will be granted guidance now the handle or the ring has come in your hands and it will not let you drown in the ocean of misguidance and secondly urwat ul wuska is the knowledge of deen so the reward of overcoming taghut is that you are given tawfiq and knowledge of deen you cannot force anyone to Uh, hold this ring you have to strive you have to come forward to hold this ring and the struggle the effort the striving has to come from within you you can never hold this ring from outward pressure everyone cannot get hold of this urwat ul wuska and once you get hold of it now you are secure in a strong protection and free from wrong beliefs the shaitan is struggling the taghuts are struggling to get you but you are safe and sound in allah's hand now if one gets to know the meaning of this verse in its correct sense then it becomes a solution and an answer to all our problems and he is protected forever 
Now just look at the beautiful sequence of the Quranic verses right after the Ayatul Kursi which explains the awe, the majesty, the excellence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over everything. We are told that you hold on to this being and you are protected forever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to get hold of this Urvatul Wuska and help us to overcome all the taghuts that are from within ourselves and that are outside us which are forcing us away from the being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa akhirud dawana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alamin